I did go to Hobbiton, but they were going to keep me there because they were running short of orcs. Now, have I got this right? I don't want to be nutting it as a Scottish thing we do, you know. There you go. So I've been living in America now for 21 years. I was in 20 years in Vienna, Austria, where my children were born. And my wife's American. I'm Scottish. The kids are Scottish. Um, you know, when I came to the States, there was always the challenge with accents. So I explained this. I, I, I don't want to bore you to death, but it's... It's that Americans love accents, and I find it interesting, you know, everybody has an accent, but all of a sudden I'm kind of an unusual person because I've got a Scottish accent. So I have to, they think I'm an Irishman, and I said, look, it's very simple. This is how it worked in Britain. There are four tribes in Britain, and let me explain to you. When the gospel came to the English, they received it because it was something they could make a culture from. The Welsh received the gospel because it was something they could sing about. The Irish received it because it was something they could fight over. And we Scots received it because it was free. <laughs> and that's a true story. I want to talk to you tonight about, um, about a wider picture, if you like, than just an apologetic topic. Because something is happening in our world, and we have to understand that all of our answers, all of our, co all of our conversations come from within a framework, a story, a narrative. And the narrative of Western culture is basically disappearing rapidly. And we as Christians need to know there are alternative narratives forming. How does the gospel engage in the challenge of the big questions of life, not just on these topics individually, which are all symptoms of the sickness of this affecting our culture, but how do we deal with the big questions of life, the things that drive us as human beings? The Christian life is built on three legs of a stool. The Bible talks about faith, hope, and love. If you need to know your, temp take your spiritual temperature, you can measure how you're doing in terms of your faith, your ability to trust, whether you're hope and hopeful, and whether there's love in your life. Those are the three legs of the stool. The one that's not mentioned very often in Christian circles is the question of hope. And yet Christianity is a faith of the resurrection. It's a faith of transcendence. It's a faith that talks about the God who is in charge of history. So I want us to think a little bit tonight about this role of hope particularly, because hope in the 19th and 20th century went through a bad time. If you read literature, and I like to read old books and some of my friends there, you look at movies or stories about the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, it was a time of great expectations. We had new technology, we had science, we had new economies. People were fanning out over the world. It was going to be a time of enormous change. The writer H.G. Wells wrote about this in many of his scientific visions of the future. But then the guns of August 1914 brought us into the First World War, and then within 20 years we had the Second World War, so that cumulatively, within the wars of the 20th century, 130 million plus people were killed. So the theories of progress, of man getting better, began to die a death. We went with this idea of an optimism, an optimistic hope, to a kind of a pessimistic gloom that has settled down upon culture now, where the only thing we can live for is born to shop. I shop, therefore I am, or watch movies, or consume endlessly. So we have no clear direction, no clear narrative, no clear story. But I want to begin with a passage here in Romans chapter 8, and 24 and 25. The whole chapter is worth reading, but just this is a reminder where Paul, talking to the Romans, says, For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. Who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. And this comes at the end of a chapter where he's talking about God's transcendent purpose in history, that there's coming a day. Christ has come. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. The answer to history is in the one who shepherds history to its end, to its goal. Progress is not going to be the answer. But this issue of hope is very serious. Because all around our culture, particularly among young people, we're having rising suicide rates, a rising sense of emptiness, a rising sense of panic. Hope is a very practical thing. David Aikman, the Time journalist, said, hope is the heart's deepest longings. We know what hope is when it's present, and you know when it's absence. You know when people have lost hope, anything to live for. Emily Dickinson wrote, Hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Now, it's hard to estimate how important hope and hopefulness are to a flourishing life. 
Desmond Tutu said, hope is being able to see that there is light despite the darkness. And when I was thinking about this, I was thinking of a story. What's the story that, how do we illustrate that? What's a picture? Well, a number of years ago, some of you remember August 5th, 2010, there was a massive tragedy in Chile in the Copiapo mine, in the San Jose Copper Gold Mine, a collapse. 33 men were trapped 700 meters underground. They're five kilometers from the entrance. And of course, we're watching the story and we're seeing the biographies of the men. We saw their faces and we know that people were getting in contact. And as the story was unfolding, you saw people praying. You saw families outside crying and waiting. And what kind of technology could they bring in to rescue these men? The men knew that the outside world had been contacted, but they were living in hope, but even as they fought off their fear. And then finally, on October the 13th, 69 days after they had been discovered, the last man was brought to the surface, and the world rejoiced. The miners were trapped by circumstances beyond their control or abilities. They were totally dependent on some greater source of help. They had to wait, they had to endure, they had to trust until rescue happened. In fact, they had to wait in hope. And some of us, that's what our life is like. We're living in a life, but is there any hope? Maybe a bit more money, maybe a better job, maybe a romance, maybe a relationship. But is that enough to hope for? Because so many of us, we have so much to live with, but nothing to live for. And hope is dependent upon a narrative, upon a story. And despite affluence and abundance, something is wrong. You see, the modern era began with an idea that rational men and women were in control of their destiny, that we could build the brave new world. Give me the tools, the toys, the technology, and I could build the brave new world. Well, here's a French philosopher, Chantal de Stahl. She's describing the situation in France. And having studied French thought for decades, now, French philosophers are not almost the most cheery of people, so, uh, you you know, take it with a a pinch of salt or maybe a glass of red wine. (laughs) Such is our situation at the turn of the century. The 20th century, born in the worship of the future, is now ending with shame for the past and contempt for the future. Having been too often betrayed by our expectations, we look upon any idea of promise as a virtual betrayal. If hope can be compared to a well in a garden, it is as if we now felt that the well had been poisoned. We're all too aware of our checkered history here in New Zealand. You look back in your past and some of it was good, some of it was bad. How much should we be guilty of? Or can we have a future with all of these demons buried in our past? The same in Australia or in Britain or in America. We've exposed so much hypocrisy, power games. We live in the post-truth world. So we're no longer naive. We've internalized and inculcated a deep sense of suspicion. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we've got so good at reading between the lines that many of us can't read the lines anymore. We suspect everything. We question everybody. We question every motive. But we don't know who to trust, and we're terrified. How can you have a future with no one to trust? That is a big issue. The shifting mood is suspicion. The the, the postmodern turn opened our eyes to the concealment of power. And part of this in truth, there are hidden motives. There are uh, 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 people distorting claims. The deconstruction project has deconstructed so much of 19th and 20th century that we don't know what to stand for anymore. Here is a a journalist in in Atlanta. And he sees this rising sense of cynicism. And I say, we talk to university students, we talk to young people, and I talk to older people, and they're the worst at times. This sense of brooding cynicism. Oh, the life's all good, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, everything's horrible, you know, blah, 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 the Americans are going to blow up the world, the Chinese are going to blow up the world, or everybody's going to blow up the world, or it's all going to die a heat death, so let's go out and just have a party. Get in the jacuzzi and relax, right? Listen to Wilbur Caldwell. Idealism is fostered by hope. Realism is fostered by experience. Skepticism is fostered by uncertainty. And cynicism is fostered by disappointment. And so it comes full circle. For at the root of all disappointments lies the trampled remains of hope. You see, we all sense something is not quite right. I mean, New Zealand is a beautifully efficient, lovely country. I mean, my wife and I have been enjoying every minute here. People are so nice, they're so friendly, and you do things a bit calmer, and it's so organized and clean. But even behind the facade of all the order, you know that something's not quite right. There is something wrong, something brooding. We long for happiness, peace, justice, a better life. But 
Here's Caldwell again. What is worrisome is this. The corruption of the American dream and its counterparts elsewhere seems to have spawned an unflinching, self-perpetuating strain of cynicism that's blind to these cycles of improvement. And thus it's neither tempered, diminished, nor reversed by periods of good news or by the prospect of better times. In short, today many Americans, and I would say Westerners, remain cynical no matter what. So maybe if we get a better government, maybe if we can up the economy a bit, maybe if we, but what we don't want is no God or God's thank you, no religious things. Jean-Jacques Rousseau famously wrote, man is born free, but is everywhere in chains. Sounds great, doesn't it? I believed that when I was 15 years of old. I, I left my house. I ran away from my parents. You know, I, I went out on my own. And I was free, free. No more parents, no more school, no more trouble, no more anything. Who's washing my clothes? What about my food? Who's cooking that? And all of a sudden, I realized I had to get a job. I had to have money. I had to wash my clothes. I was free, but I wasn't free because I didn't understand what freedom actually meant. And as we try to build the brave new world, we're always looking for someone to blame. Here's again Rousseau. Civilization is a hopeless race to discover remedies for the evils it produces. So young man, young woman, if you're not happy, it's not your fault. Someone's to blame. Your parents, your school, your culture, your history, someone's not you. You, don't, you have no responsibility. You're just a victim. And putting it plainly in words that many today accept or adopt, this is Rousseau again, nature made one happy and good, and if I am otherwise, it is society's fault. Great. So I don't have to take responsibility for any change. The reason I'm unhappy, miserable, or maybe just a nasty individual is because society made me this way. Or maybe it's because you've got a broken heart, a broken soul, and you're damaged goods, and you need redemption and healing, forgiveness and spiritual renewal. The wrong diagnosis will give you the wrong prognosis. But in the Enlightenment, the European Enlightenment onwards, this cascaded around the world, God was rejected, removed, and replaced. Man was now the measure of all things. And we would take care of ourselves. We'd build the brave new world. Or at least we would know who to blame for our miseries. Two British theologians, Richard Balcom and Trevor Hart, said this. What essentially happened in the Enlightenment origins of the myth of progress was the loss of transcendence and the reduction of eschatology to the imminent goal of history. So there is no God, there is no reality, so we bring all of this down and we try to build heaven on earth, turn earth into heaven. All our utopias, all our dreams, all our expectations, all those theological categories were relocated into the imminence of life. And the results? Well, education and technology were now the means to the goal of history, which would be understood as an imminent goal, the product of the historical process, unless we miss the point. By these means, human beings were perfectible and the world infinitely adaptable to human needs. Education replaced grace and technology re uh, replaced the creation. Now, another non-Christian writer looking at this kind of stuff, John Gray, the London School of Economics, He's listened to the proclamations of Richard Dawkins, the new atheist, and many of these people. And he said, these men are fundamentally religious. They're missing something. And he came up with the clash with Al-Qaeda in the West. He showed that much of the radical Muslims were reacting against a religious vision that was being imported into the Middle East that they did not want. They did not want the West view of freedom. They did not want the West standards of living. They did not want the immorality. And he, he comes up with what he calls the positivist catechism. And I want you to read these words. He said it's a religious catechism, but many liberals in our universities, in our television announcers, people in our movie industry, they believe these things. Many people do. So what is it? Here is the, the religious vision at the heart of modernity. Three things. First, that history is driven by the power of science. Growing knowledge and new technology are the ultimate determinants of change in human society. Second, science will enable natural scarcity to be overcome. Once that's been achieved, the immemorial evils of poverty and war will be banished forever. Third, progress in science and progress in ethics and politics go together. As scientific knowledge advances and becomes more systematically organized, human values will increasingly converge. How's that working out for us? All we need is more time, study, and creativity. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the word utopia means no place. We keep inventing utopias, but there is no place. We're traveling towards a future without a destination because we think we can build the brave new world on our own terms. 
So what about this thing, hope? In the book of Psalms, which is the prayer, peop- the prayer book of the people of God, all across the ages, you see the psalmist crying out time and time again, life gets very, very dark. In Psalm 42, verse 6, he says, Oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mazar. Earlier on, he says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God. You see, one of the tests of a worldview is its livability. Can we live under modern conditions? Why is it so many of our kids are committing suicide? It's an epidemic in the U.S. People talk about American gun laws. They talk about the violence. But more kids are killing themselves by suicide than shooting each other. And here in New Zealand, I understand it's the same problem. Why is it that 12 and 13-year-olds have got to that age and already there is no hope? They've barely formed a vision of life. They've barely had any sense of existence. And you're willing to kill themselves. That says that something is profoundly wrong in our culture. And if we don't admit that, we're not turning to a sick, a sick, the sickness and dealing with as it is. Here's Chantelle Del Sol talking about, to us as Westerners, you as, as, as New Zealanders, uh, me as living in America. But the words have the same resonance. He says this, she says this, Western man at the beginning of the 21st century is the descendant of Icarus. You know the story where Icarus put on the, the wings and flew up to the sun and the sun melted the wax and he fell and crashed to his dead. He wonders into what game he has fallen. It is as if someone has thrown him into a game without giving him the rules. When he asks around for instructions, he is invariably told that they've been lost. He's amazed that everyone is content to live in a world without meaning and without identity, where no one seems to know either why he lives or why he dies. You see, hope is so important to us as human beings. We were made for hope. Richard Balcom and Trevor Hart, two theologians, said, hope is a matter of both knowledge and will. We know what happened before, and we know what we desire. He's talking here about the cross and our human hearts and longings. But it's characterized above all by the application of imagination and trust to a future which is essentially open and unknown. How can the future be open and unknown unless there is one who holds the future in his hands? I remember years ago going into Eastern Europe and and hearing from a brother when we're smuggling Bibles in the communist world. And someone says, well, we don't know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. And that makes all the difference in the world. If you have nothing in the future, nothing but repetition, more of the same, busier, faster, or better, why or how could there be hope? Because if you have to have, have hope, we have to answer the question of reality. Is there a God or is there not? If there is no God, then this is nonsense. If there is just slime plus time plus chance, then just do more of the same. And hey, you die, that's it. Life sucks. Sorry. What is the nature of reality? If hope is to be real, it has to meet certain conditions. It must be greater than what we see. Therefore, it has to be transcendent. It must be able to overcome all the limits and limitations that we face individually and as human beings. Therefore, it has to be powerful, all powerful. It must be something fuller, better, complete, therefore satisfying. But fourth, it must be trustworthy. It must be desirable, therefore it must be good. It must answer the heart's deepest longings for love and security. Therefore, it has to be welcoming. And I would suggest to you it needs to have grace and mercy. But that's the characteristics that God is, that God offers. But if we blot out the horizons, there is no God, where else can we turn? Like the miners trapped in the cave, all of us want, all of us would like a happy ending. Good stories. I mean, how many of you go to a movie? You've done this or you've picked up a book. You get in a film, you're about three quarters through, and all of a sudden it turns you think, oh, what in the world? What kind of stupid ending is that? I mean, and it ruins the whole thing. You go home and you tell, don't go and see that movie. Don't read that book because it's absolutely idiotic. Like the Matrix trilogy, for instance. I mean, the first film was great. I mean, you know, Neo and the thing in the Matrix and all this. Can I was brilliant. And then at the end, what? Where in the world did this thing go? At least Tolkien ended his trilogy with a good ending to the story, which is precisely his point. Does history have a good ending? You see, unless Christianity is real, unless there is a God, the Alpha and the Omega, then history has no good ending. But if there is an ending, then one who writes the story has the final word. 
And that's why hope is so important in Christian life and in all of life. Balcom said this, the sense of an ending which the quest for narrative meaning seems necessarily to entail suggests that either reality cannot satisfy this quest or it will do so eschatologically. Are we subject to blind forces of chance and necessity, of necessity or do we live in a God-ordained world? Listen to these two guys again. The only credible eschatology, given the failure of the myth of progress, is a transcendent one which looks for a resolution of history that exceeds any possible imminent outcome of history. Only from the transcendent possibilities of God can this world be given a satisfying conclusion. We're living in the age of anxiety, aren't we? At a recent event, I was sitting with a group of people. There was a group of scientists and others, and this young couple, young, uh, two young students were in front of us, and they were describing just their life, how they felt overloaded, heightened expectations, the fear they faced. And I thought what they were talking was about a loss of meaning, but really what they were describing was a sense of panic. They said, there's too much information. You know, the, in school, our parents, the school, the church, everybody demands more. We just can't cope. And it was frightening to see how desperate they felt this anxiety in their soul, in their bones. This is what one writer calls the saturated self. Kenneth Gergen says, we find lives without direction, movement from one locale and culture to another with little residual effect. For today is no necessary prelude to tomorrow. The present hour, no companion to the next. As we move into the postmodern world, purpose is replayed, pre replaced with pastiche. So, okay, I'm supposed to get a job. I'm supposed to get A's. I'm supposed to have the body beautiful. I'm supposed to have all the great holidays. I'm supposed to do all these things. I'm supposed to go out to all these places. Why? Why? We don't know, but we're on the treadmill. Expectations are given to us by our family, by our parents, by our schools, by our culture, by our economy. It needs our money. And we're chasing round and round in circles like on the, the hamster on the wheel going round and round and round. And we do not know why. Friedrich Nietzsche famously said, he who has a why to live for can bear any how. The problem is that many of us have no why. We live moment to moment from the shopping mall to the couch. The iPhone, the ever permanent noise of stuff in YouTube and Instagram and whatever. We have so much to live with but so little to live for. In an inversion of this phrase, my colleague Os Guinness says, he who has no why has no how. And young man, young woman, or older man, older woman, that's the question of hope. Because if you don't have a why to get out of bed for in the morning, why am I doing this? Not just to get a paycheck, not just to get retirement, not just to, so I can go off and live in the South Island and visit Hobbiton here in the North, whatever, for the rest of my life. What are you living for? What is the why? Do you have a why? They will see you through not just life, but through suffering, through death. We need something bigger. Carl Henry said, Christianity offers a living hope and sufficient reason for it. It carries assurance that God is at once Lord of the future and sovereign of the present. That's all the reason one really needs for confronting the ever crumbling expectations of modernity with the enduring principles of Christianity. You see, ladies and gentlemen, apart from setting up apologetic organizations, we need to have answers to the cultural malaise in this country as well. We need a theological understanding of what's going on in New Zealand and New Zealand hearts. And the churches need to offer answers, not just short-term sound bites to specific questions. We need to engage with the narrative, engage with the sense of despair, and use imagination and prayer and ask God to lead us with a message of hope. For your nation. There are barriers to faith, but there are bridges to those with despair. And let me give you an example. One of the people that seems to have touched a raw nerve all around the world is the psychologist Jordan Peterson. Now, he's a controversial man. He says things that get people angry, he gets kicked off of platforms, and yet on YouTube, he's in the millions of people that watch him. His lectures are very, very popular. He's popular from his clinical practices. Why is he a phone? That's a question we need to ask as Christians. Well, I would say there's three things, at least, that stand out. First of all, he emphasizes that life is tragic. You see, young people know that. Despite their parents' wealth or the inheritance, they know that life hurts. Bad things happen to good people. Good people do bad things. We can't be shielded from pain or sickness or sorrow, cancer or breakdown or getting fired for jobs or accidents on the road. Tragedy occurs on a wide scale. 
life is tragic. But it's not only tragedy, but it is tragic in part, and we have to recognize with that. But secondly, he emphasizes transcendence. He's not a Christian in any terms that we would understand, but he looks at the great stories. He looks at Buddhism. He looks at Islam. He looks at Christianity quite favorably. He looks at Judaism, and he knows that there's more to life than meets the eye. We are more than just the sum of our particles and our DNA and our choices. There is something out there. He doesn't quite know what it is. But he also then emphasizes truth. That truth is important. We need to speak the truth, live in the truth, and find the truth, no matter what it costs us. Ladies and gentlemen, how serious are you about hope? Are you willing to go for hope no matter what it costs? Are you willing to pay the price of making the hard choices? Are you willing to be rejected by your friends, by your friends in the university? Are you be willing to be considered an, an idiot, even if that meant the ultimate hope was anchored in a reality that is the truth, it is reality, but culture doesn't recognize it. Robert Fulham said, I believe that imagination is stronger than knowledge, that myth is more potent than history, that dreams are more powerful than facts, that hope always triumphs over experience, that laughter is the only cure for grief, and I believe that love is stronger than death. This is in his book, All I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, in kindergarten Uncommon Thoughts and Common Things. I want to talk to you in closing about the gospel of hope. The theologians Richard Bowker and Trevor Hart put it this way, hope is among those capacities or activities that mark off the distinctively human within our world. The quest for meaning, truth, goodness, and beauty is closely bound up with hope as an activity of imagination in which we seek to transcend the boundaries of the present, to go beyond the given, outwards and forwards, in search of something more, something better than the, gov the given affects us. I was arrested several times during the communist years, and it weren't long times in prison. I had two weeks in Czechoslovakia, 40 days in Yugoslavia, uh, several days with the Russians. Um, and these were interesting experiences, yes, and I can talk about them, but one thing was happened. During the time in Czechoslovakia, which was the hardest of the three for me, I was not allowed to talk to my colleague. I was shut up day after day. I had no Bibles, nothing to read, nobody to speak English to. It was in a small cell where you could barely move, and it was only me and my thoughts. And there's nothing like being shut up with yourself for two weeks, let me tell you. It's difficult. And of course, I believed in God, and I could have done the whole thing. God, why did you do this? Why did you allow this? Why did that one go to solve a thing, was it? God has sent us to Czechoslovakia, we knew that, and God had allowed us to go into prison. So whatever was happening, this was God's will, and I had to just suck it up and take that as what was going to be. But in those moments, when I finally got through my emotions and I realized God was my only hope, there was nowhere else to turn. It didn't matter what else they took away. He was still there. He would still welcome me. He would still rescue me, even if I was locked up for the rest of my life. And of course, after two weeks, they let me go, which was nice. So there was the hope was vindicated. But sometimes our life is like that we're suffocating in the darkness, and we wonder, is there any hope? And the answer is yes. Why? Because we know. You see, where to look? Our anxiety does not come from thinking about the future, but from wanting to control it, said Khalil Gibran. But ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says the future has already come to us. I want you to listen to these words. If you've, you may be familiar or maybe you're not, but if you've heard them, hear them afresh. If you've not heard them before, listen to these words. This is the word of the opening to John's gospel. This is God's word spoke into a culture where Rome was dominating, where the Jews had been crushed, that the Messiah had come. Listen to these beautiful words. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that's come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not notice the order of the words there. We often think we need light to have life. Look at this. It says it's the other way around. Life precedes light. We need life, a new kind of life, a life that only God supplies. There is life available, but it's not on our terms. It's on his. And if you want light, then you need to have the life. He who has the son has life. Who who does not have the son does not have the life. That's what he promises. You see, so I'm a, when I became a Christian in 1977, I didn't really fully understand. I mean, it's taken me years to figure this out. I don't know if I ever figure it out. 
I believe, all I had was an encounter. I was a bouncer at a dance hall, for goodness sake. What did I know about Jesus? And then people would ask me all these smart questions about Freud and Nietzsche. I, whatever. I said, look, I really met him. He's real. It's really. And then they would tear it down or throw some silly arguments out. And I didn't have, but you see, a man with an experience isn't at the mercy of a man with an argument. And it's not all about experience. Now I have arguments and experience. But here's what Christianity says about history. And I want you to hear these words very carefully. The world that is, is not the world that was. The Bible says the Bible, it was created good, but it's damaged, disordered. There's now something wrong. Sin is an addition to the world. It's not normative to the world, but it's a part of the fallen reality now. The world that is, is not the world that must be. So I reject determinism, fatalism, or blind acceptance because the power of the cross, redemption, means that change is possible. Not perfection, but change. I know alcoholics. I know drug addicts. I've got a friend who's a former KGB agent. I've got a friend who's a, a former Muslim. I've got people from every part of the world who have experienced the same Christ that I experienced in Glasgow, and he changed their life, and they have eternal hope. Because the last part is important. The world that is is not the world that will be. A new day is coming. Donald Trump doesn't have the last word. Neither does Vladimir Putin, or the Chinese Premier, or Erdogan, or tsunamis, or earthquakes, or any other tragedy. History is in the hands with the one with all power to control it. And ladies and gentlemen, if you've come here tonight with cynicism, despair, or de let it go. Because when Paul was writing to the Romans, think of this. He's writing to a church in the most powerful empire at that time. And he knows the struggles. They have no politics. They have no representative communities. They have no committees. They have no insight in the legislature. They have none of that. So what does Paul say to them? At the end of Romans chapter 15 and verse 13, he says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot give what we do not have. The church cannot offer hope or apologetics or any answers if hope is not a part. New Zealand doesn't need finger-pointing moralists telling it how to be more righteous. It needs good news that there is a savior, there is a king, there is a kingdom, there is a government. The king has come to set us free and he is the God of hope. Amen. Let's turn to him. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. Please consider supporting us to get more content just like this. Visit support.thinkingmatters.org.nz or click on the link in the description. If you really enjoyed this topic and would like to go further in depth, I would recommend purchasing Thank God for Atheists by Timothy Morgan. Timothy candidly shares his journey by letting atheists speak for themselves examining their logic to see whether it holds up or not. We stock this book in our online store, which you can find a link to in the description. Mm -hmm.